Hello and welcome to the second episode in a series that I'm doing, which is Super Opera Fun Review of the X-Files every season. Um, this is the second season and I'm just going to get straight to it because we don't have a lot of time. Episode one is Little Green Men, written by Glenn Morgan and James Wong, directed by David Nutter. He directed some good ones last season, the first season. So I wrote down in my notes, abduction of Samantha backstory with Mulder's childhood. Mulder pursues an X-file outside of the FBI and Scully helps him. He wants to get actual evidence. They have a, new, a real partnership. They talk about SETI, more alien stuff in this app. Mulder needs to learn Spanish. I noted because he does not know it. And I feel like that should be required for being in the FBI. Even in the 90s, I feel like that should be required. But hey, what do I know? Anyway, um, Jorge dies, this guy that he's dealing with, and Mulder records a message on tape for Scully. This is a big moment, sweet moment between them. Confessing Deep Throat said, trust no one. Before I could only trust myself, now I can only trust you. And I was like, yay. And then Scully finds Mulder. He explains that he saw the aliens and she touches his head. It's very sweet. And then he gets in trouble with Skinner, again, about leaving his assignment. CSM says, CSM, as I've noted here, is who is referred to as Cigarette Smoking Man or Smoking Man in the lore of the show. Um, but I will call him Chain Smoking Man because I think that's more accurate because that's what he does. Uh, so Chain Smoking Man says, your time is over and you leave with nothing. Then he lights up a new cig and exits. Mulder is allowed to continue by Skinner. And Fox says to Dana at one point, I still have you and I still have myself, which is really sweet. So there's some good moments there, more alien stuff, more Samantha stuff that'll come up later in the season. Ignore the construction noises, which are apparently happening today during my recording. I can't record any other fucking time, so it's going to be even more super awkward than usual if you hear it. And I'm hearing it, so it will affect the audio because I'm annoyed by it. But I will try to set it aside and I will move on. So the next episode is Ep 2, The Host, written by Chris Carter, directed by Daniel Sackheim. We saw him in the previous season. Mulder is still bummed about not being able to work with Scully, so he lets her do an autopsy on the dead body in his regular case. He wants to leave the Bureau if he can't work with Scully on the X-Files anymore. There's a fluke or flatworm in the body. And then um, he's told he has a friend in the FBI. Scully tells Mulder she would consider it more than a, pro a professional loss if he decides to leave, which is very sweet. We all take our orders from someone, Mulder, says Skinner. And that gives the overview of like what's behind the FBI. Like there's a shadow government, somebody's in charge of everybody. So I, I like that part of it. Uh, nature didn't make this thing, we did, Scully says. Chernobyl did it, turns out. <laughs> so there's a little real world stuff with Chernobyl in that episode. It's pretty good, it's nightmare fuel, the monster that you see in it. it, it it, I was on a, a treadmill at the time I saw it. I was like, sheesh! What the fuck? <laughs> there was a lot. Uh, ooh, I really like this episode. Okay, this is the one that I came away saying, okay, I really like this episode. Yes, I really like the first two episodes, but we were just getting going. It wasn't really there yet. But this one really hit it. Um, this one is written by, I would say, stories by Dan Morgan. And when it's a story by teleplay, whatever, I, I'll put them in categories. So then teleplay by Glenn Morgan and James Wong. And then directed by David Nutter, who's always really good. Um, technology telling people to kill people. Dangerous AI. Sound familiar? Mulder got, got the case and works on it with Scully, who also conducts autopsies. She does that a lot this season. She just puts herself into any situation. She's like, I'm going to get an autopsy. Because apparently when you're a doctor, you can just perform as many autopsies on as many pe bodies as possible, no matter your jurisdiction. Which they kind of get to later, but I'm not going to talk about it. But they do point that out a little more. But I think that's funny. Uh, so Charles Manson is on TV, 
that old office guy sees in the store, so the old office guy that we follow from the beginning. Duchovny shows off his arms again when he finds some weird flies. Um, the lone gunmen are back and introduce us to the concept of micro cameras that fit on the back of the fly. She's tasty, says Frohiki about Scully. LSDM pheromone is chemical found in the flies. DDT is exposed with verifiable information on its dangers. They just learn not to... Wait, how did it say? They just learn how to not be so obvious, is what they say about poisoning us <laughs> as a nation. <laughs> which is what this is about, which is interesting. Um, this episode is giving me Roundup vibes with the spray problem, subliminal messages from electronic devices. All people are phobic heightened their phobia and the devices helped alleviate that phobia fear the oldest tool of power if you're distracted by fear of those around you it keeps you from seeing the actions of those above says Mulder and we should remember that because it's gonna be really important in real life too <laughs> or it was Ed whom we've been following throughout the episode the old guy ends up about to perform a mass shooting at a college during a blood drive. Mulder and Scully reach him in time to prevent it. So that was a serious topic that was uh, broached in 94, I believe this was, or 95. I don't know if we're in 95 yet. I don't think so. So anyway, Sleepless is the next episode. That was a really good one. That one really stood out. Could be a contender for top five. We'll see. And I'm going to do a countdown this time because it was very not interesting the way I did it the first time. So I'm kind of failing everything out, trying to see what works here and what you guys enjoy and what you don't. And I'm going to be pretty quick and I'm going to get to the point and it's not going to be as crazy as last time because the last time I was on camera and then that didn't work out. So now I'm doing it just audio. So it is a different story. So Sleepless is episode four. Howard Gordon wrote it. Rob Bowman directed it. We love him. He also did the Fight the Future film. So we'll see him later uh, when I do that review. And I am doing the reviews of the movies, just so you know. I'm doing reviews of every goddamn thing X-Files related. As long as it's relevant. Fire at beginning, and it seems like another fire starter situation or a simulation to scare a man. Music got intense in the part where the firefighters show up. I remember that. I can already tell this season that there is a bigger budget than season one. More Skinner in this episode. Mulder's new partner is upset that he ignores him. It's Crycheck. I know him because I remember him from later seasons when he was a major villain. And he's going to present himself as a villain in this season. So stay tuned. He will be a big character. He sees the chemistry between J Dana and Fox. Scully tells him, tells them that, Ms. that Dr. Grissom from the beginning believed he was burning, but he wasn't. It killed him. Yes, yes. So he's like, it's a simulation. So this is a, a lot about simulations in this episode, which is interesting to think about because are we in a simulation? That sort of thing, you know. Candyman, or Tony Todd, is a guest star. He plays Augustus Cole. He's the villain, of course. He's a Vietnam vet trying to atone for his past sins, which is an interesting topic also. The fact that Vietnam happened and a lot of people were affected by that on both sides of the conflict. And they touch on that a lot in this episode. Mysterious Dude, which is what I refer to him as because he's like the successor to Deep Throat who's been contacting Mulder, meets Mulder, telling him that Grissom was performing experiments on soldiers and Cole was part of it. He wasn't. He hasn't slept in 24 years, imagine. Externalize his dreams and effectively alter reality, says Mulder. So I, I wrote that down. Crycheck is mentioned by Scully and Mulder has a good moment with her on the phone saying how appreciative he is of her. I still love them. Of course I do. A lot of Crycheck in this episode. Mulder explains what's happening to him, including Cole being an avenging angel trying to right the wrongs he and his squadron did in Vietnam. Mulder shoots at someone he believes to be the doctor who conducted the surgeries and Cole, uh, on Cole. Um, Crycheck says he wasn't there. Cole holds Girardi hostage. Nobody made you do anything. You volunteered, they say. Crycheck ends up shooting Cole after he aims his gun at Mulder. Mulder says you did the right thing. Cole dies and finally gets to sleep eternally. I wrote. <laughs> Crycheck is a new villain. He was working the chain 
Working with the chain smoking man, my own designation. <laughs> Scully is a problem, says Crycheck. Every problem has a solution. Responds, CSM. And then, yeah, I wrote virtual reality. So that's what's pretty much about this episode. Then we get to the next one, which is a very big episode. One of the bigger episodes of the season. And it's Dwayne Barry. And we need to remember that this happened because it kind of gets brushed off until the finale when they mention it again. But something happened in this instance. So this was written by Chris Carter and directed by Chris Carter. One of the rare ones where he wrote and directed the thing. He's former FBI and was abducted by aliens, so Mulder is naturally interested in the case. Uh, they want to prevent Dwayne from killing the hostages he's taken at a travel agency. Mulder tries to talk to Dwayne and says he believes his story. Then Mulder is traded for a hostage by Dwayne. Now he's a hostage. Dwayne doesn't believe Mulder understands, but Mulder convinces him by talking about his abduction experience as a child. This is a very Mulder-centric season so far. So far. <laughs> Scully finds out that Dwayne is suffering from a rare psychosis that causes delusions and makes him think he's been abducted. She says he's a pathological liar due to a brain injury he sustained in the line of duty. Mulder finds out after Dwayne is hospitalized that they found evidence of drill holes in his teeth, which is what he described to Mulder about his abduction. She scans the fragment at a, a scanner of a grocery store and it makes the register go haywire, beeping like crazy. She leaves a voicemail for Mulder saying the metal has a code on it using, uh, used to catalog Dwayne and then she's abducted by him while screaming for help from Mulder. And then Dwayne wakes up in a hospital worried he's going to be abducted again. This is a, uh, the first two-parter of the season. Um, then we have Ascension, episode six. So that one was a really good episode, Dwayne Barry. I don't know which one I preferred. Let's get to it. Okay, written by Paul Brown, directed by... Actually, Dwayne Barry was also nominated for an Emmy, so that's important too. So that was Emmy-nominated uh, for writing, I believe... So that's interesting. Okay, written by Paul Brown, Michael Lane directed Ascension. So Mulder gets the message and investigates Scully's disappearance. I would say that even though she's gone, ah, they get rid of her. Mulder gets the message and investigates Scully's disappearance. He finds Dwayne and Dwayne says they took her. So it ain't Dwayne that took her. <laughs> Mulder roughs him up in his er interrogation. Did you did you hurt her? And then Dwayne apologizes and says they had to take her. I love this scene because like you see how much Fox cares about Dana in that scene. Crycheck tries to get info from Mulder. Mulder tells him nothing. I think he knows not to trust him, which he does, uh, which is good. Trust no one, baby. Scully is having tests performed on her. No alien baby yet, though. <laughs> Crycheck disobeys Mulder's orders and goes into the room with Wayne. Mulder scolds him, and Skinner comes in to scold Mulder for disobeying his order and taking Dwayne into custody. Dwayne dies shortly after being left alone. Gee, I wonder how that happened. <laughs> Crycheck meets with CSM and asks what to put in the report on Barry. He says the truth. CSM says he's taking care of Scully. Mm -hmm. Crycheck basically admits to killing Dwayne Barry after what you had me do, he says. CSM is playing the long game with Mulder and Scully, I wrote. Mulder talks to FBI about Barry's autopsy results, suggesting someone poisoned him to death. The mysterious man appears to Mulder again and says, No one can help you now. They only have one policy. Deny everything. And that comes up again later. Big conspiracy is starting this season. Mulder finds a cigarette in Krychek's car. How did that get there? He tells Skinner he suspects Krychek of murdering Barry. What do you know about Agent Krychek? Krychek is unreachable, unreachable now. Skinner says he's reopening the X-Files. Bam! Here we go. That's what they fear the most. And then Mulder meets a relative of Dana's, and he gives her Dana's cross necklace, which was given by her to Dana when she was 15. She says, when you find her, give it to her, and gives it back to Mulder. This ends up being the mother. I wasn't paying attention at the time. I didn't realize that that was her mother. Mulder looks at this guy at the end of the episode. Things are getting better. Episode 7, 3, then we have 3, one of my least favorite episodes of the season, just because it was so frustrating, you'll see why. Written by Chris Rupenthal, Glenn Morgan, and 
James Wong, directed by David Nutter, who couldn't save it, sorry. <laughs> Mulder is back in his office with the X-Files. He finds Scully's badge and pa packages it. He heads to L.A. to investigate a creepy death. Bloodsuckers. So now we're on bloodsuckers. This is a real thing. People really do think they're vampires, and it's really sad and weird. And they have, like, a disorder, or they think they have a disorder. It's very involved. So there's, like, a cult going on here. I'm not even going to, like, read all the notes. Um, but he meets a bloodsucker who killed a guy at the beginning of the club, at, at a club. When they congregate, her name is Kristen, the most basic-ass name. She tries to feed her blood to him. He asks if she's afraid of AIDS. She's like, I wish I could die. And then there's a lot of them in this. If you wanted to see him flirt with another woman, go ahead and watch it, I guess. Um, but there's not much in the way of real-life stuff in this episode, which is why I'm, like, glossing over it. Didn't do much to move the plot. He still misses Scully at the end. And when his, his lay kills herself along with the other bloodsuckers. He doesn't really react like he would react if, she, if it was his love of his life. Which is Scully. But whatever. Um, he got laid. So good for him I guess. In the next episode we bring back Scully. But Scully's in a coma. So that's in one breath. Uh, Glenn Morgan and James Wong directed, I mean, wrote it. Uh, R.W. Goodwin directed it. Um, it was nominated for cinematography for the, the Emmys. Back to Scully, yay. We get some background on Dana's childhood from her mother who talks to Mulder at the beginning. They got a headstone. Fucking hell. <laughs> we can't give up, says Mulder. Uh, Dana returns, but she's in a coma. The lone gunman return. They're going to help get to the bottom of her alien experiment. Dana could die. There's a message here about not prolonging life and how unnatural that is, which I enjoyed. That's all well and good, but Dana isn't dying. How dare this show even think about killing her? CSM is back, making threats about Mulder to Skinner. Skinner wants him to stop smoking. CSM puts it out in an ashtray. Why is there an ashtray if he doesn't allow smoking in his office? Uh, Mulder calls him the Cancer Man. I like my nickname more. It's hard to get into this episode when I know Dana will survive, but I can appreciate the performances, even if some of it is kind of cheesy, like the dream sequences she has with people from her life uh, who are talking to her while she's in the coma. CSM is confronted with Mulder about after he receives an anonymous message about where CSM is. I've watched presidents die, says CSM. If people were to know of the things that I know, it would all fall apart, he says. You can kill me now, but you'll never know the truth, and that's why I'll win, he says. Mulder resigns. Sk Skinner doesn't accept. He gives a story about him in Vietnam, and it's a compelling scene. And Mulder figures out that Skinner gave him CSM's location. So he's on his side. Um, mysterious man who succeeded Deep Throat in divulging info about the powers that be can contacts Mulder and says he need he used to be like him. Tell him tells him to let go of Dana. Uh uh, no way. Melissa, Dana's sister, chides Fox for not seeing her and expressing how he feels to her. He goes to see her. He says he feels like she's not ready to let go or to go. He goes home to cry. And next scene, she wakes up. True love. <laughs> he gives her necklace back at the hospital. Okay, episode nine, Firewalker, which is not to be confused with Firestarter, season one. Written by Howard Gordon, solo. Uh, directed by David Nutter. Back in California for a new X-Files case. Um, volcano robot. Phil Erickson is the dead man. They find the robotics engineer. He's afraid of Trepkos, who was seen as a prophet. This one has a lot of this ice kind of vibes of the first uh, season. So make of that whatever you will. Trepkos is the main sub suspect. He was a genius who ran, who ran hot and cold. He kills one of the others working on the project. Mulder and Scully discuss the case and he says he's going to check something out. Scully says she's coming with and he says no. She tells him I'm back and I'm not going anywhere and decides to stay with the dead body and perform an autopsy, which she does a lot this season. Mulder heads into a cave with Ludwig, the robotics engineer. They run into Krepkos who kills Ludwig who was infected by the fungus that's taking over his body. Back to Scully, who says she thinks they're going to be okay. But one of the people one of the people involved with the project is experiencing symptoms as she tries to assure her through the door. Mulder talks to Krepkos to see what he found after the first descent. 
He says Erickson discovered a new life form. He says it's a parasite. There are a lot of those this season. Get ready. And it wa- wants to find a new host. He says the... I do like that, by, by the way, about this season. It's not just Freaks of the Week. You know, we're getting this and that and the other. Except three. Fucking hell. But... <laughs> You know, it all kind of comes together. There's a narrative being spun, and there are different connections between the episodes. You don't just forget what happened. And you you move on to the next episode, and you're like, oh, that happened in this other episode, and they're bringing that back. I like that they're bringing stuff back in this. And that's how real life is, too, because there's a lot of threads to a lot of the conspiracies in real life, and you'll, you'll find that. Okay. Um, then it says, he says, while the, the whole team was exposed to the spore, Mulder is kept from leaving to check on Scully, who could be infected. He gets to her in time to prevent it. Krepkos mourns his teammates. The whole lab is cleaned by the biohazard team. Cover up. Krepkos is presumed dead, along with his teammate, Jesse O'Neill. The robot survived, but will never be used. A decent episode, but not a lot happened that will affect the mains in the future. Then we got one of the best episodes for me. Episode 10, Red Museum, which you wouldn't think would be the be- one of the best, but it is. Chris Carter penned this one, directed by Wynn Phelps. I love how cinematic this show is. Mark Snow's score stands out and brings a lot of atmosphere, so I noticed that in the beginning. The Church of the Red Museum is a cult that Mulder and Scully visit. They don't like animal slaughtering and think it kills our- their own soul. Which is an interesting subject that comes up a lot, like animal suffering and human suffering and, and you know, how to alleviate that and that sort of thing, which is interesting. Uh, Chris is killing me again, writing a cute moment with Dana and Fox. This time they end up at a BBQ joint. Dana makes a comment about the church having their work cut out for them. Then Mulder for no fucking reason. Other than the obvious wipes away the barbecue sauce on her lips. Really? Platonic my ass. She even reacts to it. Then they move on. She's referred to by the sheriff's son as Mulder's wife. Nobody says anything about that. Nobody corrects him. So many great moments this episode. Cows are shown getting shot up with genetically engineered growth hormones in a scene with Scully questioning a farmer. He says it's because of the growth hormone that teenagers are acting more mean and committing rapes now. Scully says that it's safe because it's approved by the FDA, my sweet summer child. He responds, says who? The government? My man. (laughs) The kids of the town have been eating cows injected with alien DNA. You know how that happens. The same as in the Ur and the Meyer flask. Um, it caused a flu. The case is open and unsolved. So that's an unsolved case that we got that tackles the human growth hormone that really exists, sadly. Like, like they're just pointing shit out at this point. <laughs> they're, but they made it alien, of course, but... You know, you never know what you're putting in your body. You've got to be very careful. The government will fuck you up. Episode 11, Excelsis Day, written by Paul Brown, directed by Stephen Surgic. Convalescent home. This is a really standout episode in terms of acting, and I'll tell you why. Nurse is strapped to a hospital bed and attacked by an unseen force, raped by something invisible. She says it was an old man she, know, she knows at the home. Sex harassment fad, I wrote down, sound familiar. Hal Arden, the suspect, hits on Scully and apologized for stepping on Mulder's toes. There they go again. (laughs) Hal's roommate, Stan, tells him to keep quiet and takes a pill, an experimental Alzheimer's drug, Depranil. Uh, Hal ends up in the hospital after having a negative reaction when Scully says she thinks the drug might be responsible for the sexual assault in the home. Mulder is reluctant to go along with her theory, a nice switch. He's giving her those eyes again. And Orderly is pushed off the roof by something invisible and killed. Mulder's starting to agree with Scully on her hypothesis about the drug. Mushrooms are found that belong to the Orderly Gung, who's been dosing residents with them. He says a spirit from the past killed the Orderlies out of revenge for his mistreatment. Mulder tells Scully that the mushrooms caused the murders and rape. She's reluctant to go along with this th- with his theory and questions the medical medicinal properties of mushrooms, which is interesting. The X Files is ahead of its time again, talking about shit that won't be commonplace until decades later. 
Um, Mulder is trapped in a bathroom filled with water by the unseen spirit. The nurse is thrashed about in there too. Scully has to save him and runs into Stan having an episode. She tells the doctor and helps get Mulder and the nurse out of the room. Water goes everywhere as they flow out. Then the health department takes over and the trial of the drug is suspended. The doctor who distributed the drug is replaced. This, the residents get worse as a result and that's the end. This one had some interesting topics and really good performances by the guest actors who are mostly uh, older and you can tell that they've been acting a long time. Ep 12 is next, Aubrey, written by Sarah B. Charno and directed by Rob Bowman again. Legendary Special Agent Cheney. Oh, this is a really good episode, by the way. Known for a 1942 serial killer case in Aubrey, Missouri, is found in the beginning by a detective named BJ who somehow stumbles upon his grave. Someone is trying to mimic the murders committed in 1942. Mulder and Scully find a connection between a 1945 crime and the murders in 1942. Turns out that ch the chick BJ is the granddaughter she attacks her grandmother, who was attacked originally. Mulder and Scully race to her, and she's still alive. BJ is on the loose. Mulder heads to Coakley's, who, that's her grandfather, who was the guy who killed everybody, or killed people, um, as she pays her grandfather a visit. She nearly kills him when Mulder comes in. Scully arrives, and Coakley dies. Another voiceover at their, of their report at the end. So that's going to be like... A thing that happens every few episodes. So this one didn't really touch on it. It was more like a serial killer episode, but it was really interesting. Um, and then the whole, like, being possessed by the dude. Episode 13, Irresistible. Chris Carter wrote it. David Nutter directed it. We start with a funeral. Worker at the grave des desecrates the young girl's body and gets caught. He's a cosmetologist. No one ever believed it could happen, says Box, the local FBI agent. Scully is spooked by the death fetishist. Mulder worries if the guy will murder someone to get off on it. We see the fetishist pick up a hooker, and I'm getting American Psycho vibes. He wants her to shampoo her hair. He clearly loves her hair. He kills her when she figures out how weird he is. He takes some fingers, hair, and fingernails. Creepy shit. Creepiest ep- one of the creepy episodes. Um, Scully is beside herself. She, she can't handle this case. It's, it's getting to her. Um, meanwhile, the killer Donnie gets a job as a delivery man, so he'll be able to stalk women easier. The actor is doing very well with his fucked up character. He's somewhat robotic in the way he speaks. Mulder tries to figure out the killer's motive. He says he could hate women, and it might be back, uh, go back to his mother. Give me Ed Gein vibes with that, and without the necrophilia. Uh, Scully starts to see a therapist. She has a lot to work through. I trust him with my life, she says about Mulder, which is really nice. More feelings are, ev are evident in this episode. Thanks, Chris! <laughs> Donnie abducts Scully and Box uh, suggests Mulder tries his mother's residence. Scully's scared but manages to break away and fight back just in time for the FBI to come and subdue Donnie. Mulder checks if she is okay. Cue the clip. We get some paramedics here now. Just help me get movers. How did you find me? His mother used to own the house, willed it to his sisters. The patrolman saw his car out back. Get him out of here. Sure you don't want to sit down, Scully, and let somebody take a look at you? I'm fine, but... episode one of the best I said <laughs>